So hopefully you can all see see that. That looks fine. Yep, great. Okay. So um, yeah, thanks for the uh, opportunity to speak, Andrew. Um, so I'm one of the science officers at the Botanic Garden, and I work on the Growing the Future project. Um, so in this talk tonight, then I'll tell you all about our new seed bank that we've set up in the Botanic Garden Science Centre. Uh, and then in the second part of the talk, I'll share our experiences of harvesting meadow seeds sustainably from the Botanic Garden's um, organic farm. So it's the first time uh, last year that we'd done this ourselves. Uh, so previously, um, we'd had Emma's Gate and Windrush they'd come in and harvest the seed from our meadows using their, their equipment. Um, but now we've done it fully uh, ourselves and we're keen to share these experiences so that others with meadows can do this themselves too. Just uh, change my slide here. Yeah. Yep, yeah, here we go. So you've probably all heard of seed banks um, and this, this one here, the Svalbard Global Seed Vault is probably the most famous in the world. Um, this is uh, situated up in the Arctic uh, on an island off of Denmark. This one stores a uh, seed of crop varieties. And then the second most well-known seed bank is the Millennium Seed Bank, which is managed by Q uh, Wakehurst in Sussex. And this is the largest and most diverse seed bank for wild plant species. The most seeds can last for, for many, many years, potentially hundreds of years if it's processed and stored in the right way. It's a bit of an evolving science. You know, the seed banking only, only really started uh, in the 90s, uh, but conserving seed of wild plants and of crops, uh, but especially you know, wild plants is more important than ever uh, because uh, last year Q estimated that two in five plant species around the world are threatened with extinction. You know, there's so many pressures on wild plants, uh, be it pests and diseases, climate change, development, intensive agriculture. So it's a really positive thing to do um, to bank seeds. Uh, so that if a species reaches a crisis point in the future, seeds are available then to prevent populations going extinct. So you can think of seed banks as a bit of an insurance policy in this way. Now the Millennium Seed Bank has partner seed banks all around the world uh, and they each collect and store seeds from their own areas and then send uh, each part of each of that collection uh, to the Millennium Seed Bank. They keep part themselves and then send uh, some back to the Millennium Seed Bank. And our new seed bank at the Botanic Garden is one of these um, partners working on wild plants. It really is an amazing place at the Millennium Seed Bank. It houses more than 90,000 uh, seed collections from around the world. That's um, 40,000 species. I was really fortunate to go on a three week course uh, all about seed conservation, uh, learning from the experts then about how to collect process and store seed for long-term conservation. So their, their buildings are you know, really, really high spec, multi-million pounds, um, like kind of bomb-proof um, kind of building with uh, walk-in uh, cold rooms and things. So you can see there you need to put on uh, cold room jackets then to actually walk into these rooms because they're kept at minus 20. Um, so yeah, really, really fortunate to, to go on a course there. Um, and then my, my task was to come back to Wales and assess the seed bank here at the Botanic Garden. You might wonder why we need a seed bank um, in Wales, given that the Millennium Seed Bank is doing such a great job. They've actually banked 98% of the, um, the UK flora from at least one population. But to conserve seeds, um, or to conserve um, species properly, you need to capture genetic diversity. Uh, so this means uh, actually collecting seed from multiple populations. So you know, species, um, can differ slightly among the different populations. They can be adapted differently to the climate or to pests and diseases. So by capturing uh, more genetic diversity, um, you, you're securing species um, much better for the future. And then when we worked with the MSB then to see how many collections they had from Wales, around 75% of Welsh native plants hadn't yet been banked from Wales. So these are the gaps that we're, we're working on to, to, to fill. Uh, we were really fortunate then at the Botanic Garden to have two really good quality lab spaces available in the Science Centre. So it's upstairs where I am now. Um, and then we've gradually set up um, these labs uh, with the equipment that we need to 
uh, professionally conserved seeds. So for the, the past couple of years then we, we've gradually set these up. The photo there is the seed processing lab where the seeds come in from the field, they're checked and they're cleaned. And then this is the, uh, the storage lab where the seed is. Um, so it's packaged and then stored at minus 20. I've made seed banking sound really easy there, but there's a bit more to it than it sounds. So in the next um, few slides, I'll just run through the different steps of seed banking. And there's quite a bit of desk work actually before um, we go into the field. There's a bit of you know, quite a bit of planning, uh, thinking about the target species, which species are most threatened and that we should be prioritizing, identifying sites where they grow, looking at the, the phenology, uh, when the plants are flowering and, and when we need to be in the field to collect ripe seeds. And then we always collect um, or get um, permission to collect from the landowners and also you know, permits if it's a triple SI or something like that. And then uh, in the field, um, seed banking aims to collect 10,000 seeds per population. So that's all about getting the genetic diversity uh, as well, which is easier said for some plants than others. Um, but we need to do this in a sensitive way uh, so it doesn't harm the future of the population. It's not always possible to reach um, 10,000. So first of all, we assess how big the population is, how many seeds there are available, and make sure that we never collect over 20% of the available seeds. And then we also do a couple of checks before going ahead. We make sure the seeds are fully mature. Um, so the best way to do that is to, to collect them at the point where they're naturally dispersing. This is a useful thing to know if you want to do seed collecting yourself. So with, with dry seed heads like capsules or pods, you're waiting for them to, to start splitting and opening up. You might hear the seeds rattling inside. And then with uh, fleshy fruits like berries, you're looking for that colour change. It's kind of obvious, really, isn't it? Um, so the you know, berries will be going red or black as opposed to green. And then we also do a, a quick quality check by just cutting a, a few seeds in half from a few plants. Healthy seeds uh, generally have white firm contents inside the endosperm. Uh, that's what healthy endosperm looks like. Uh, but you might find that they're empty which can happen uh, if the plant hasn't been pollinated properly or if there's been some stress like a drought. Uh, quite often, you know, it's not all the seed heads um, in, a, in a, a seed head or, or not all the seeds in the seed head are, um, uh, are viable. And then uh, you might also find, it, find that they're infested. So the photo there on the bottom right is some seeds we collected from uh, the nature reserve here at the garden, uh, from knapweed. Um, and you can see there are a couple of grubs, I'm not sure, in the middle there, the yellow one, there's one to the right. Um, so we don't actually look at these as pests because, um, you know, I guess, you know, if, you, if you're producing seed commercially, you know, like a big seed company might think of things like this as pests. But um, so they're, they're, they're going to be some sort of seed weevil. You can see uh, the holes in the seeds, how they've munched through the seeds um, in the, yeah, probably when the, the flower head was kind of just maturing. Um, we, we actually kept these in a jar over, over winter then to see what they are, to try and work out are they seed weevil. Uh, but actually what emerged then in the spring were two parasitoid wasps. So wasps that were actually parasites inside those grubs as opposed to you know, the, the grubs forming the insect that they go on to, to form. So you know, really fascinating stuff. Uh, and they're likely to be native insects. So um, all part of the ecology, keeping everything in, in balance. Then. We always collect into breathable bags. This is a useful thing to know if you're collecting seed yourself. So um, cotton drawstring bags are great, but also the free tote bags you get, or even old pillowcases. And it helps massively to collect on a dry day. Um, so if you've got damp seed, then you'd have to handle those really carefully, spread them out on newspaper as soon as you can. Um, and then never keep your seeds in direct sunlight or at hot, hot temperatures, because uh, that can affect the viability then. And when it comes to processing back in the lab, um, even in a well-equipped seed lab, the cleaning is, is pretty hands-on, involves lots of sieving and shimmying, uh, quite uh, repetitive, but, but really fun. And then cleaning the fleshy fruits can be a bit messy. Uh, they need to be carefully mashed into a pulp once they're ripe, and then the, the pulp um, uh, washed away to leave, uh, to leave the seeds, and then the seeds need to be dried after that too. 
Now these are three of our more expensive bits of kit. The two on the right there are seed aspirators. So they're, they're really fun to use actually. So they blow air currents through your unclean seeds. So, you know, from the field then you'll have lots of dust and chaff, uh, bits of the seed heads in amongst your seed. Before we bank them, we want to clean that away or most of it uh, as much as we can. Um, and these aspirators then blow an air current through, carry away the dust and leave a nice clean seed sample there. The ones on the right then are incubators. That's what we use to dry the seed. The drying is a really crucial stage for the long-term seed banking. We use these to dry the seed down to 15% relative humidity, uh, which you'd never do, you know, even inside spread out on a bench um, in the UK, you know, you, know, you might get 50% uh, humidity um, in, in a room like this. Uh, but actually for long-term seed banking, you need to take them down to 15%. And these incubators are also great because they can um, be used for germination. You can set the lights at certain uh, hours per day uh, or set certain temperatures. So then it gives us the capability to germinate a species, you know, say they need autumn conditions um, and actually want to get them going in the middle of summer, we can. Um, and also you can experiment because certain wildflowers need uh, certain conditions. And sometimes it's not exactly known what conditions they need to need to grow so we can um, do experiments with these as well. And then we seal the seeds in uh, these laminate foil pouches to keep them airtight. There are similar things to um, used in some food industries, you know, like um, I don't know if, uh, posh coffee and stuff like that. You can sometimes see it in these in these laminate pouches. And then they're stored at minus 20. And this is to really slow down the respiration in the seed. Uh, that really that cold temperature then uh, slows the respiration and slows the aging. And the, the previous step by drying down so well and removing a lot of the seed moisture before they're frozen, then this prevents uh, any damage for, um, from ice crystals forming inside the seeds. But um, yeah, you can't actually dry any below any below 15% um, relative humidity because the seeds you know, they're still respiring in the freezer, although really, really slowly. And they do need some moisture then to keep going. Uh, when we're in the field, then we also collect field data, uh, things like the habitat, so what other plants um, they, they were grown with, uh, other details, land any details, the location, uh, and all this information then gets put on our plant collection database. You probably noticed in the botanic garden how all the plants have got little numbers on the labels. So there's a big database behind that. And these seeds then are part of, part of our living collection. Um, although they're, they're seeds, so they're still living. So a little bit different, um, but um, I'll show you a slide later on how we are actually growing some of these plants too. And then we also take a herbarium voucher specimen for each collection in the field, which is uh, useful for revisiting uh, to check identifications without having to grow the seed on. And then, of course, we want to uh, keep an eye on how the, the seed is, is doing in the seed bank. So these photos are from the Millennium Seed Bank. Um, we actually send half of each of our collections to them, uh, and then they're going to share their germination data with us uh, from, from the collections that we send. And we'll also be doing our own as well. So then we can be sure if they're, they're the same at Millennium Seed Bank and here, we can be sure then that um, we're doing a fairly good job. So the nice thing about the seed bank project is that it's a real collaboration across the garden. So it's involved uh, growing a future project that I work on and also the Biophilic Wales project that Elliot uh, in the lab out there works on. Uh, and also the um, <clears throat> science staff and the horticulture team as well. Also the, the placement students then they come out and help collect seeds so they get trained up in, in seed banking as well. So we've got uh, off to a really good start. We've banked around 100 collections to date, and I'll, I'll just show you a few examples. So our first couple uh, actually right on our doorstep on Wineglass National Nature Reserve. So we thought there's no better place to, to kind of practice uh, than there. Um, so some of you, or all of you, have probably seen the, um, the spikes of the greater butterfly orchid that we've got in the hay meadows. There's, there's hundreds of them in, in June. Uh, so we made that one of our, our first collections then first collection from Wales for that species, um, seed banked 
from the UK. And then also the County Flower of Carmarthenshire, we thought, oh, we've got to do that as one of our, our first ones as well. So we made a good collection of that. We've uh, been up to the Great Horn a couple of times as well, done quite a bit of collecting up there. And this Goldilocks aster is uh, an example where conserving multiple populations in seed banks is, is really important. You can see on the map there how um, the different populations are so spread out, those little red dots there really isolated there's no way that they're going to be pollinating uh, each other uh, between those sites there and even losing you know one of those populations then it could turn out to be like you know 20 percent of the uk population or so uh, and each of these populations then they're, they're likely to be a little bit you know genetically distinct because they've been because they're so isolated um so losing just one population then means that you've probably lost a bit of genetic diversity and then this is called genetic erosion. Um, so then there's, there's less genes there for you know, the species to adapt to climate change and, and things like that. And of course, these uh, local extinctions then can have knock-on effects to other organisms, you know, the insects uh, and, and uh, other organisms that depend on those plants. And uh, it's really uh, cool how this seed collection we've made actually is already gone towards a reintroduction project in Cumbria. So just um, a year after we'd made the collection, we got uh, contacted by uh, a conservation project then that wants to reintroduce this, um, this um, species then into an area of Cumbria. And, and actually the closest population there was, was, was the great tall. Um, so we, we sent them some seed then to grow on and reintroduce this plant. This is also one we managed to bank from the, the Great Orm. We only got around 500 seeds from this, but considering it was only from two individuals we could find, we linked in with the um, recorder for the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland. Um, she knows the area really well, and we only found two shrubs. I think there were about five, but um, at the time we could only find two. Um, so yeah, critically endangered on a, on a UK kind of level. Um, so it's really good to, to bank that one. You can see another photo of it there. It gets um, eaten by the goats a little bit, I think. And then closer to home in Carmarthenshire, uh, there are two small populations of catch flies uh, near Buryport. And this is the benefits really of having a regional seed bank like, like we are, and we can be well connected to what's uh, going on in our own backyard. So Richard Price, uh, the Botanical Society of Britain Island uh, recorder for Carmarthenshire, let us know about these populations. With the small flowered catch fly, there's only 12 plants growing on the harbour walls in Buryport. We made a good uh, seed collection from that. Um, and also from the sand catch fly that grows on the dunes uh, nearby. Uh, there's a lot more uh, individuals of that, of that plant, but it's the only population in Wales where it grows. And then last year I managed to get the red hemp nettle, uh, which actually grows as an arable plant in a, in a lot of situations, but then also some other habitats like shingle banks, shingle uh, banks and beaches, which is um, yeah, really interesting. It's undergone drastic losses uh, on its arable sites uh, because of uh, weed killer use. Uh, like a lot of other arable species, it's um, had a similar fate. We managed to um, make a collection then from one of its three surviving populations in Wales on Gower. Um, so only 270 plants there last year. So goes to show how, um, how small some of these populations are. And then a few weeks ago, uh, we managed to make a collection from the June gentian, which is a rare annual of uh, June slacks, only found in seven sites in South Wales and a, a couple uh, in Devon. So it grows nowhere else in the world apart from uh, South Wales and Devon. Um, and sometimes these populations are only a few plants, uh, but it's been a, a really good year for it on Gower. So perfect time to make your seed bank collection. And so you might wonder, what do we do with the seeds um, as well as storing them long term? Um, well, we do release the seeds, like I mentioned, with the Goldilocks aster. We release them for conservation projects. Um, and also we do grow some of them on. So the garden already did a lot of work to conserve certain Welsh natives before we started up the seed bank. And these are some of the Carly Greens plants in one of the polytunnels. 
Akali Green as our Welsh native horticulturalist. So sometimes we will grow on a small amount of seed for further conservation, uh, display it in the Welsh natives display area, uh, and also then in that uh, process actually bulk up the seed. So by growing on the plants, uh, you can then harvest more seed and we're more flexible then in, in what, um, what kind of uses that seed can go to. So that brings me to the end of the seed banking bit. Um, and then I'll go on to the meadow seed harvesting on wine lass. So uh, most of you have probably been to wine lass. We've got some fantastic hay meadows. Um, so it's a, it's a working organic farm as well as a national nature reserve. And we uh, decided then to trial the sustainable harvesting of wildflower seeds. What we wanted to do is to provide a case study for other landowners on how wildflower rich hay meadows can provide a bit of income as well as um, really working for conservation. So without harming their conservation value. Uh, and in fact, by doing the seed harvesting, it's a big thumbs up for conservation because that seed is going off to create new hay meadows. And you've probably heard all the story at the Botanic Garden about how uh, green hay has been uh, an amazing success in creating new meadows. So by taking uh, a crop of hay and on the same day moving it to a recipient meadow where you want to, to create a, a species rich meadow. Um, so it's, it's just been amazing at the Botanic Garden how successful that's been. Uh, and so green hay we think is preferable over seed and looking at uh, other evidence online that seems like that, that is, is the case. But of course, there are um, limitations in how far uh, you can take this green hay because it needs to be cut and spread on the same day. So seed is really the way forward for creating new meadows where you can't get hold of, of local green hay. And there's also an increasing demand for wild harvested meadow seed. This um, kind of wild harvested meadow seed is different from some uh, commercial seed mixes you see where the commercial companies grow uh, lines of, of these wildflowers, um, more like arable, arable kind of species, and then mix up different, um, different mixes with different species in. But this kind of wild harvested meadow seed is a mixture of all the species uh, that are seeding at the time of harvest that are naturally there. So to create a, a new a native species rich meadow, this is the kind of seed to go for. Um, so it's in the seed regulations, it's called the preservation mixture. Um, but you know, if, you, if you're looking out to buy seed, you, you want to look for that wild harvested kind of tune. So last year we borrowed a brush harvester, but then uh, this year managed to, to buy one ourselves. It's a machine towed on the back of a quad bike uh, or another vehicle. Uh, you can hook it up to a tractor or um, a Land Rover or something. Um, and then you just make uh, passes across across the field then and the brush that you can see on the top right photo then spins around uh, brushes off the ripe seeds without actually cutting the sward um, and then the flowers uh, or the unripe seed heads just bounce back and they can carry on maturing so there's a really great sustainable way of, of harvesting seed you can use these on heathland as well sometimes um, the, the brush there you can adjust the height of it uh, you know, different meadows then have got different height sward, and then you can get different um, different species then if you set it at different levels. Um, and then, of course, the, the other good thing is that by not cutting cutting the grass and, and the sward, you can then make multiple harvests at different times of the year. So say in July, you could make um, a harvest and it'd be really rich in the yellow rattle seed, uh, but then you can also you know, make another uh, harvest uh, you've got to be careful not to over harvest, by the way, but um, they say making then a seed collect uh, a harvest in August, then you'll get more of the, the knapweed and the great burnet. So although it doesn't cut the sword, you do get lots of stalks still. Uh, the brush like tends to brush off quite, quite, quite a lot of stalks. Uh, so the, the bag of the grassy stuff there is what actually comes out of the brush harvester. So if you ever do it yourselves, don't be put off by that. Actually, there's a load and lo a load of seed inside there. Uh, and what you need to do is to spread this out on a tarp. Uh, we use the, the cow shed while the Welsh blacks were out on the uh, out grazing them for the summer. Um, and we use the cow shed to spread out the hay 
uh, on, on a tarp, then somewhere you know, with good airflow and in the shade, then not in direct sunlight. Um, and then you just need a, to kind of shimmy it around with a rake every other day or so. Um, we actually used the polytunnel uh, this year um, in some you know, the weather. Uh, in August, you know, you tend to get quite a lot of thundery showers and the humidity goes up. So on some of the, the damper days, we actually use the polytunnel there or the damper kind of weeks um, when we managed to make a harvest just before we used the polytunnel because that was a better drying space and dried a bit quicker. So the aim with the drying is to take it below 75% relative humidity. These um, hygrometers that measure the humidity, um, uh, you, can, you can pick up cheap versions online uh, quite easily. Um, so taking it below 75% then means that you, you shouldn't get any mold growth. So obviously mold is, is the enemy really when you're doing this kind of seed harvesting and if you want to store it for any, any length of time. And then uh, there's quite a bit of sieving and there's no real quick way of separating the stalky stuff uh, from the chaff. But raking it off, we found, helped um, quite a bit first. Then, so you rake off the main stalks and then go through with the sieve then to get, get the seeds out. Um, uh, some chaff, you, know, you can see in, um, in the photo um, here as well, how there's lots of the chaff there, you know, the casings of the seed and that's but yeah you know, it doesn't matter at all um so this kind of wild harvest of seed mix is always like this and actually it helps the seed go a little bit further when, when you're sowing it then so last year we managed to produce around 27 kilos and that was from just two days harvesting so it's you know not bad at all really uh, and then this year we've upscaled a bit uh, the horticulture team have, have been leading the harvesting um and they, they've upscaled and we've got around 200 kilos. So, so it's uh, really good. Um, and then you, you probably asked then how, how, what area of, of uh, meadows could this cr create? Uh, well, the sowing rate is usually, the recommended one is about four grams per meter squared. It's not as much as you think really. Um, you, can, you can sow at a higher rate if you want, but, but um, at four grams per meter squared, then that could, could create 12 acres of new meadows. Uh, so that's yeah, a really, really great thing. And then we, we package, package the seed. Um, and then this is a good time to say that you do need a license to sell uh, this kind of seed if, if you're going to sell it. So uh, you need a license from the Animal and Plant Health Authority. But this is actually reasonably straightforward. The regional seed inspector has been really helpful. Um, so if you're interested in doing this yourself, then then you can, you can let me know and then I, I can uh, give you some advice about, about how to go about that. Um, and believe it or not, then the, the label, uh, each packet needs to have a pink label. So it's to do with the, the color coding on different seed, seed um, types, you know, grass is green and so on. So um, uh, that, that's actually part of the regulations. And then there's different information on there, yeah, useful information like um, where, where um, the seed was collected from, what genera you have in there and the, the date it's collected and, and things like that. We marketed it then under our Saving Pollinators brand, um, which is a scheme we've got linking with local nurseries in Wales uh, that grow plants without uh, peat and pesticides. And those plants um, are really good for pollinators and backed up by all the, the science work that we've got going on here. So, so this year with the sales, we've managed to make a couple of bulk sales to a construction company and a local authority. Um, and we're hoping for more interest with those kind of um, um, yeah, customers then in the future. But we have got seed left. So we'll, you know, we're welcoming inquiries for, from anyone who's looking for meadow seed. And then last year, as a bit of an experiment, we also tried harvesting single species by hand. This is a great thing to do, actually, you know, just after lockdown, then we got our conservation volunteers uh, involved uh, and they were a great help then. Um, but as you can imagine, it's really time consuming um, and, you know, you're, you're up against the economies of scale that the seed companies have got that grow wildflowers. Um, they're more in cultivation beds where they can then um, you harvest, say, mechanically um, and things like that. So. Um, <clears throat> harvesting by hand is yeah it takes a long time and also the cleaning and the packaging so the, the seed companies have got 
the big machines then to fill the seed packets and everything. Um, but it went well anyway, we managed to do it. Um, but this is where yeah, I think you do need to be wary about how much seed you take, especially with the annuals like the yellow rattle, uh, because they depend on the new seed setting each year then to, um, to create the population for the following year. So I would say if you're, if you're collecting by hand, then I stick to the seed bank and you know, we, we only collect the maximum 20%. And with that, you can really be sure that you're not harming the population. So uh, that's a good kind of uh, guideline. Uh, and then at the Botanic Garden, then we will rotate the harvesting around the different meadows then. So each year we'll, um, we'll harvest from, from different ones and just to make sure we're not, we're not harming the, the populations. Yep, so you can see um, that that was the kind of filling kind of process. So you can imagine how long it kind of took to do all that. But the, the packets um, all, all look really nice. Um, and what we what we will do is if there's uh, species, key meadow species that we're finding um, don't grow well from our brush harvested mix, then actually we might look into uh, hand collecting those particular ones. So the great burnet then, uh, we think it, it, it you know, should have been in our, our later harvest in August. Um, but um, yeah, there might be some key ones that we find don't grow so well from the brush harvest. Uh, a little bit early to tell, yeah. And then, yep, that brings me to the to the end of the talk then. So um, plenty of time for questions there. Okay, thank you very much, Kevin. That was very good. Excellent. Uh, if you'd like to stop screen sharing now, we yeah, can yeah. spread ourselves out across the screen. So everybody feel free to unmute your audio and video now for a bit of chat. Well, actually, nobody has put a question in the chat box, but never mind. Just to, to start off, uh, if we think about the, uh, oh, here we are. I've got a question about orchid seed from yeah, Stella. Okay. So Stella, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question. Right, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Right. Thanks. My, my question was about orchids because I am um, uh, my limited knowledge of native orchids that they require very specific fungal conditions to germinate and grow. Mm -hmm. So is it worth harvesting the seed? Uh, no, you, you are right. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, for the seed to germinate, they need um, uh, mycorrhizal fungi there. Um, so I think at other other sites. So it depends, you know. It's if if the the orchid seed is in the brush harvest mix, you just have to cross your fingers, I guess, that the the right fungi are in are in your meadow where where you're going to sow the seed, uh, and they might be already there in the soil. Um, I think we probably, yeah, don't don't quite know know the answers yet. Um, but what what we have found with uh, throughout the garden is that the orchids have grown really well from the green hay uh, on our meadows here. So it could be because the fungi are already in the soil. Um, but um, and, and what we're not sure of yet is actually how that compares to, to the seed. So I wouldn't be surprised whether it turns out that the green hay is actually better for establishing orchids than, than the brush harvested mix. Uh, I think we'll definitely have uh, orchid seed in the mix. It's just a case of uh, whether they'll grow or not. Um, and then whether they actually um, whether they're drying and everything, because they're, they're quite um, sensitive seeds, the, the orchids. With seed banking, actually, you've got to be really careful with how you how you handle them. They're basically fast-tracked in the seed bank, so you don't want to leave them um, drying uh, on the bench for, for too long at all. Um, so, so, yeah, if you're trying to get orchids, I, I'd go for green hay or mimic green hay, where you take the, uh, the orchid spikes, you're from, if you've got permission. Um, uh, I don't know, just a few capsules, maybe, you know, uh, the ripe ones and then spread them the same day on a meadow. I, I think that's probably the way to go, but it's something we want to look into more at the Botanic Garden there. Orchid seed is, 
we had a lot of orchids on airfield this year and we left cutting it till late hoping that you know they would produce a lot of seed yeah, but yeah. it's just like dust i yeah, mean is, uh, when when you're yeah. when you're doing your uh you know uh seed bank collections of orchids how do you deal with it because it's well, just orchids, like a pile of dust yeah well to um the good thing is, though, because we aim to collect 10,000 seeds per population, actually, with orchids, you can easily <laughs> hit the target because in each capsule, there's, there's probably, I mean, probably a thousand seeds or more. Um, so it's quite easy to, to, to hit the target. But um, when, when they grow, there must be an enormous amount that don't, don't come to anything. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, structurally, they're very different from most seeds. There's no stored food is no there? yeah 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 that's right yeah yeah so um and that, yeah. that's why they're so sensitive really so um and i think that that's i mean i'm predicting that the green hay is going to be better for for establishing orchids definitely um, yeah 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 what we wondered as well so um so yeah at the botanic garden we, we noticed that actually to get the orchids they they take an amazingly long time to to write to um to mature so even though they're one of the earlier plants flowering especially like the Southern Marsh Orchid and the Common Spotted. Um, but, you know, they're fairly early, but then they, they don't, don't ripen up until, you know, right until the end of August or even, yes. I mean, even early September. Well, September. this is what we found here. Mm. We, we had loads of orchids this year and uh, they'd all gone over, but you, you look at the, 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 the structure and it's all yeah. still green it captures uh, yeah. yeah that's so what yeah. thank goodness this year we could leave it till the end of august to cut the field yeah because and, and they had all sort of dried up and were ready to so yeah, 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 yeah. we're hoping that we're going to get more next year yeah definitely i think if, if you've got a few orchids on your meadow already then the best thing to do is actually not to cut until later or at least leave those patches yeah. so that the orchid seeds can ripen up um and because we do tend to cut the meadows here quite late yes so um and that's how we've got a lot of great burnet and that well in, in ev country. every year here we we are thinking we could never have been farmers we just couldn't handle the stress because for you know biodiversity reasons you want to leave it as late as you can mm. but the longer you leave it the shorter the day length gets and the, sure. and the dew hard. hasn't gone off the ground till yeah. lunchtime and it's That's so right. nerve-wracking but yeah. thank goodness the hay, then it's exactly dry, it? yeah but this yeah. this year we managed so yeah, yeah. so no, it went it's, well they're, the, they're what everybody wants in a meadow aren't they yeah um, I, I would say it's surprising because so I convinced my mum to um to leave a part of her meadow, her, her lawn, which is a really small garden, just you know, in Swansea, yeah. really small garden. Um, I convinced her to leave a little patch at the back, then you know, into a meadow, and a, a southern marsh orchid popped up, you know, out of nowhere. So, um, <laughs> you never know, you never know what's there, and you never know what's going to come in naturally as well. So amazing, yeah. A uh, question from Fiona and Julian: uh, Do you need a license? uh to do green hay uh no no she don't no you don't need a license to to do green hay so um okay. yeah um that's good mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> and also for single species so um yeah you know, it's good to get in touch with the seed inspector to say you know what you're planning on doing but um and he can or she can advise you as well um so there are certain regulations say with red clover because they're an agricultural species uh, so there are there's you know, plant passport regulations and things um, and of course the, the regs might change as well um, you know with leaving the eu so i'm um, definitely keep an mm. eye on it but um, no for green hay no you don't need you need a license red clover uh is a a brilliant plant for bumblebees for long-tongued bees um red clover is a native species but the red clover we see here and there, how much of that is a native wild type plant and how much of it is agricultural varieties? Yeah, it's really tricky to tell, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you, you, I think with red clover, you can offer, you often can tell if it's, you know, like one of the pure agricultural varieties because it's looking so like big and lush. Yeah. Um, and really big leaves. Um, 
So it's, it's tricky to know, and they and they will likely, you know, cross pollinate and everything. So, um, yeah, yeah. I guess you, know, yeah, going for the older meadows, then you could be sure that it's more like the wild type. Um, I've got a question. Uh, you're about the seed bank. The the seeds the, in the the picture of one of the labs. There's what looked to me like a liquid nitrogen freezer, but you don't store them at that lower temperature. You store them at minus twenty, which is sort of normal freezer temperature. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, that's right. Yeah. So there's um so but not all species can be banked in in the way i i said about today so some yeah. uh, species they won't take they don't withstand the drying so um oaks and horse chestnut the seeds just die if they're dried down conserve you know, those species that's where um uh your living collections are more important like in botanic gardens yeah. And then the Millennium Seed Bank, they're doing experiments um, storing the, the seeds at much lower temperatures, so using li liquid nitrogen. Um, we're leaving that to them. Um, but in the labs, um, actually, there was a liquid nitrogen store already there. Yeah. So we're, we, we're hanging on to it just in case, <laughs> just in case in the future, you know, you never, you never know. So, um, yeah. But, but luckily, with the UK species, um, all of, almost all of them, uh, are okay to bank in the way I was, I was uh, explaining. At minus 20. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, or the, the, the drying, it's mainly the drying. Um, Given the, the number of seeds you, you want to collect from each species and from different populations of each species, uh, you're going to need a lot of freezers, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's surprising, like, in those little foil packets, how, how yeah, and then it sounds like 10,000 seeds, but they can be little packets like this. Sometimes. Yes, I see. Yeah, but um, no, we we'll, we'll need more freezers at some point. So um, hopefully we're, we're going to get some more some lab style freezers uh, soon. Then uh, and they'll have a lot higher capacity. Um, but we'll see how we go. This is a nice thing about the seed bank. You know, we can yeah take one step at a time and then um, kind of yeah scale it up. Right. Question from Laura: Have you ever tried collecting seed using a leaf vacuum? Yeah, so yeah, we did try this. So um, yeah, we um, we used a, a leaf vacuum then to uh, collect the uh, the cats here. Um, you know, like it's got like a dandelion style seed head, uh, so kind of fluffy bits on the that are wind blow, and actually it was pretty good for that. Um, but one of the the tricky things is that if you want to put it in a you know single species seed packet that just says yellow rattle on it or, or cats here, then um, you do tend to get a, a mixed collection because you know the vacuum yeah. sucks up seeds from from other plants and stuff. You can do a little bit of cleaning to get those out, but it means a bit of extra work. But um, you know, for for conservation, I think yeah, if there's certain species you you want, um, but I think the the vacuum is a bit limited uh, to what species it works for. Yeah, um, I think yellow rattle it works a it works okay. Um, but then if you want just a general mix, a meadow mix, then and yeah, there's no 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 harm in giving that a go. Uh, yeah, you know, something that a lot of people have. So um, yeah, if anyone gives that a go, I'd be interested to to hear hear how it goes. Um, I think it it work for some, and then for some plants, and then not so well for others. So um, that would be interesting to know. Because that's a smaller smaller scale way of doing it, isn't it? And cheaper. And cheaper, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, question from Di here. And she says, this is a geeky botanical question. <clears throat> One of the species you were collecting, maybe the Goldilocks on the Great Orm, had a very dispersed coastal distribution with one little population in the middle near Manchester too. Have you got any insights into that, why there's these distinct populations? Um... Yeah, I mean, it's, it likes it likes limestone, uh, so it's like restricted to um, to areas to, with limestone. So Great Orm has got limestone, Gower, a couple of sites in Pembrokeshire. Um, yeah, and it, it, quite a few plants are like that. You know, they they prefer limestone areas. Um, 
you know, why they're so like separate, how they got there. I don't know. Yeah, it'd be really interesting. There's a lot of plants like that, aren't there? Um, I don't think it's one where, you know, the distribution used to be a lot wider and then a lot of the populations got extinct in between. I think they've probably always been fairly isolated. Right. Um, yeah, and it does seem to prefer the coast as well. Uh, another question from Julian and Fiona. Have you collected Devil's Bit scabious variants yet? We have uh, a form we collect. Oh, you, yeah. yeah you asked yeah. the question. Oh, yeah, I asked the question. No, we, we, collected, we collected a form from a friend's meadow who's since sold up. It's only about 20 minutes from where we are, um, which, which flowered about six weeks earlier than the normal ones, which always seem to be quite late flowering around us. And it also had very different leaves. And I've grown it on in our meadow and it's flowered and set seed. And it, it's, it's kind of come true to form and has those different characteristics. And I quite recently, or the last two or three weeks, I sent pics to Richard Price and he said he hadn't seen it before in Carmarthenshire. Oh, so wow. I just wondered, are you interested in in either looking at the picks or of the flowers or the leaves or collecting seed from something like that sometime. Yeah, yeah, so it sounds really good, yeah. So you know, I've noticed or heard that um, the devil's bit scabious, you know, you got it grows on the coast in Pembrokeshire and then um, also, um, yeah, you know, meadows, doesn't it? Like dampest yeah. kind of meadows. And they tend to look quite different as well. I've noticed that in our meadow here, we've got like um, the devil's bit scabious, but like... Um, a light pink kind of one so yeah there's definitely yeah. a bit of genetic diversity in it yeah um, no we we have both of those great we have both the pink and the the uh normal oh, right, okay. bluey ones locally but the, the thing that struck me about this was that the leaves are just much more rounded and it's this difference in flowering time which because because mm. loads of insects seem to really like it i think it should be grown more as a garden oh, it's an amazing amazing it's plant for, for insects. Yeah. yeah i've got some um, in my garden and it's just been covered in hoverflies and, and other yeah plants. exactly and yeah. and skipper yeah. butterflies everything yeah butterflies. and um but i i just thought well if you know if you if we if we can bulk this up it's actually very handy to have because it's extending your flowering season by at least a month if not six weeks okay um, so so, whereabouts did you collect it then what um so, so uh well we we live in north Carmarthenshire, and but it came from a meadow very close to pimsite which is north Carmarthenshire as well i was just thinking is, is it has it been reseeded that meadow or no the one it came well the one it came from uh was a very very old Okay. Uh, meadow that's got right. lot had lots of butterfly orchids and other oh, orchids okay. as well so it was yeah. very it was very very spe species rich quite right. wet okay. valley bottom meadow um mm. but i say that the people who let us collect the seed and now sold it on the property on um but uh i mean i guess you could go and visit it there but but we we managed to get it going anyway in our fields but mm. i just thought that you know, with what you're saying about, I don't, I don't know whether you've got onto Devil Spit Scabious yet, as a. Uh, it's one we, yeah, we've done quite a bit of work on because, um, you know, it's the food plant for marsh fritillary. So, um, yeah. The, the yeah. kind of gardens had a, a growing. Um, well, contract. Rob's got loads of it growing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Caterpillars, Rob, yeah. Rob Parry. Um, yeah, so um, it's one actually that, yeah, we've done quite a bit of work on the horticulture team uh, in growing it. Uh, they've been out to sites. Um, collecting it um, to grow plug plants and to reintroduce after after the heads yeah. of the valleys roads being being built but um, we haven't really looked into variants and stuff so it's, yeah be, be interesting I mean if I, if I can still find find any seed there's an outside side chance I might still be able to get some seed from it I mean would you be interested in some from this year or uh, you could or do, you yeah. rather you rather come and look at it or I, I, ju I just asking you know how 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 you how you would follow that up if you're interested in uh, yeah, probably best then leave it till next year and then we can yeah. get land okay. and then get permission and, and, and things like that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the reason I asked um, about um, yeah, whether it was a re sown meadows because you know, I mean, you, you all know that um, you know, the, often the mixes you get like from the wildflower companies, sometimes the seeds even been grown on the continent. Um, yeah. And then they can be different subspecies and things. So yeah. if it was a re sown meadow, there's a chance you know, if it looks a bit different. 
I've noticed on the road verges sometimes even like the the clovers look a bit a bit different thing you do wonder are they like a, a bit of a variant but uh, if yeah, it's an no. old, old meadow then it, it can't be that then. yeah I'm, I'm pretty certain it, it's it's a re it would have been because the history of the place was it was a very old um uh, and that the people had never gone in and done anything with that particular field so um well thank you definitely if it flowers earlier then that's that's a great thing isn't it extends the, the season yeah absolutely so your brush harvested collected seed uh that is just a mix of whatever it collects at the time um how do you 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 showed us how you package it and the the label regulations and so on um how do you uh sell it i mean can anybody go and buy it from the garden so, so last year um yeah we we um we sold online on the on, on the online shop and in the shop here yeah um so so this year then we've we've decided to to go for more of the bulk orders um because it, it takes so long to package everything and you know, the yeah. more time the staff uh, take to do all that and the posting and everything you know, the less um viable it is to take forward and, and we want to keep it going um but but then to you know meadows groups locally um we can we can sort things out so um yeah the, the other reason why we we want to focus on the you know the bulk orders and then the the, the meadows groups um really is we, we, we want the seed to go to be to go towards meadow creation in wales like as locally as we can well that was the, why i asked the question because you were just saying about how you know commercially available wildflower seed is often as you say possibly from abroad i mean if we're all in carmarthenshire something that was harvested from wine lass is in carmarthenshire yeah 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 it's as local as you can and, and there's a real um um, there's a high demand for a lack of supplies, isn't there? There's mats in um, in Windrush, uh, in Pembrokeshire, Windrush that you all, all know. Yeah. So, um, so if you're further towards Pembrokeshire, the place to buy it is is, is from Matt. Yeah. Um, but then yeah yeah if you're in Carmarthenshire, then um, yeah yeah uh, you wouldn't find any more local supply than that definitely. No, absolutely. Uh, another question from Die here. Wondering about the scarification preceding. What is the purpose of this, given that meadows cut for hay late in the year with no scarification still have yellow rattle, etc., in the following year? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so when you're sowing. Oh, that's a tricky one. <laughs> <laughs> when you're sowing the seed, then um, it's just to create bare patches of the soil. For this to for seeds to make contact with the, with the soil there, um, but that's true. I mean, in a in a meadow that's cut, you know, then you obviously you get the yellow apple coming back up, so the seed makes its way down there, doesn't it? I think so. If you use a tractor to cut the meadow, uh, or even you know, even if you use a scythe, I guess if the ground was wet, you end up exposing a bit of soil, don't you? Yeah, um, so I've got. It's surprising yeah. in the meadow here after it's been cut. It tends to be quite damp in August, or the ground does when we when we cut. Yeah. And um, you know, the tire the tire marks of the tractor and everything do do form a bit of bare soil. So I guess that helps. Yeah, you you, um, you do. You get Sorry. Up in in the in the in the tractor tracks. Then <laughs> just curious. Um. Yeah. I mean. It's interesting. Uh, I guess the thing is when you first when you first creating a med though the grass tends to be quite thick as well. Yeah. Uh, and there, there could be quite a bit of moss there as well. So um. So by then raking some of that off, creating a bit of bare soil, then uh, you're really helping things along. You might notice that without scarification, that it, that that you know that the seed grows grows pretty well. Um, yeah. But, yeah. but yeah, I think you're right. Like by cutting the 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 sward down pretty low, even by doing that, you're exposing a bit of soil usually. Yeah. Okay. What? I'm, I'm just trying to avoid extra work. Basically, I'm just... <laughs> yeah, it depends how big. If, if it's quite a big meadow you want to create, then um, obviously. If you do that with a rake, then they put a pretty yeah. good exercise, isn't it? You you do it always tells you this in books that you, mm. you need areas of bare soil. Yeah. Um yeah. what we've done every year after our meadow's been cut, um when we get a bit of regrowth, like now, we get sheep in to do 
aftermath grazing. Yeah. And they're yeah. there basically eating the grass as it grows. And uh, you know how much it rains in autumn and early winter around yeah. here. If you go and look, by the time the sheep go, when the grass isn't keeping up with them anymore, it looks like bubble wrap. Every single square centimetre has got a little hoof print in it. Yeah. And I think that's why there's no problem with seeds being in contact with the soil. I yeah, think they just get trodden in. in. Well. Yeah, yeah. But no, it's true what you're saying, how like the books say to do it a certain way. But actually, yeah. there's no harm in trying a different way. So we're actually, um, yeah. so with the green hay at the Botanic Garden, um, we really didn't do it by the book at all one year because... Um, well, we there was half of it was was uh, uh, harrowed, wasn't it? And it really didn't seem to make a huge amount no, of difference. No, so, so yeah, one of the fields, one of the yeah. areas wasn't scarified at all and it's established really well. So, um, yeah. The, yeah, I think when, the, the most important thing is to cut, to cut it low before you, you do yes, the Yes, exactly. What we did uh, was to, um, when we, uh, you always read, if you, if you want to create a species-rich meadow, you can do it just by managing it as a meadow. But the, the thing is, if you want to be sure that you get a good range of species before you're dead, it's best to speed it up in some way. So, and the, and the simplest way is just to put yellow rattle in. You're going to get colonization by other things much quicker with yellow yeah. rattle there. So that's what we did here. Yeah. And because we'd read in the books that you need bare soil, we sort of cut a zigzag of um, scrapey, bare soil lines and sowed seed into that that oh, we right, collected yeah. but we'd looked afterwards and it was actually germinating just as well either side of the yeah. slot as it was in the slot yeah. and definitely you know this sort of little experiment is, is yeah brilliant because you know you want to make things as simple as possible yeah so, um, uh, you're you're absolutely right i think the really important thing is to cut it short before you do it and then it hasn't got far to go to get to the soil yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think also, uh, eye bright as well is, is uh, you know, just, well, a, a, yes. can, can be as effective, I think. Yes. Reducing the vigor of the grasses, as, as you're yes. asking, especially if you've got both of them there. Yes. So that's even better. Well, we had eye bright appeared on its own here yeah, okay. um, about three years after we'd started managing its mm -hmm. hay meadow. And now it's there's loads of it. There's sort of big area. There was a little patch to start with, but it really gets on very well. And as you say, it's another hemiparasite. So. Yeah, yeah, both in the same yeah. family, although they look totally different. They? they do. And and it's got complicated taxonomy, hasn't it? They're people yep. are <laughs> Yeah, Euphrasia. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're tricky. We've managed to work out what which ones we've got on our meadows here. Um uh, but I had to send off the press flowers to um or press plants to the one of the one guys in the in the uk who can who can id them yes, so, um, yes. <laughs> nice uh question here do you have a price per hundred grams or um, for per kilogram for the seed yeah so per kilo we're, we're aiming for 100 pound per kilo right it's, um it's a bit pricey but um uh that's what we're kind of pitching at to make it kind of viable yeah um yeah, but uh, you know, if there's like a group order from from the Balanchy Meadows group, then we might be able to kind of look at that then. Okay. Um, I've got a question. Uh, the when you are using the brush harvester, you've got a quad bike with four wheels. The brush harvester, which is a bit wider than the quad bike, I guess. Does it make a real mess? Does it really flatten where you go with it? Uh, it's surprising, really. You can see where it's been, just because the grass is like a bit like this, you know. Yes. Um, but no, no, it all, it all bounces up. I mean, obviously, where the tires have gone over, then you know, it's a little bit more kind of, um, yeah, like compacted. But um, no, no, it does bounce up. And actually, if you go back the following week, you'd never know that. Really? That done. Yeah. That's oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, there's. There's a Marches Meadows group in on the borders of 
Wales and Shropshire, and they've actually bought uh, a thing which is a, a sort of walk behind, push it along yourself brush harvester, oh. which has two like bicycle wheels. Mm. Uh, so it, it and it's actually made in Australia for harvesting native grass seed. Right. OK. But yeah, it that's... works in exactly the same way as a yeah. normal brush harvester. But uh, obviously, it's a lot cheaper, and you don't need a quad bike to use it. Yeah, no, it sounds um, great for smaller kind yes. of meadows. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. It, it and that wouldn't make a mess. Uh, anyway, they've they've had it for a year or two, and th there's a newsletter I've uh, sent round that um, uh, they think it's very successful. Yeah, so they yeah. they they get what comes out of it looks like what you get. And then there's a lot of sieving and drying and so on. Uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, that's that. Uh, it's a bit expensive for an individual to no, get. No, it is. Yeah, I mean, brush harvest is definitely. Yeah. 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 Well, that sounds great. Yeah, I'd like to to hear more about that. I'll send you their copy of their newsletter. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, the uh, as you were saying, the the. The green hay is very well established and uh, it's a plant life has um, done a lot with green hay as well. And it's uh, everyone's heard of it, but it's quite difficult to arrange. I mean, mm -hmm. I was thinking, well, maybe I should tell people come and collect it when I've cut it. But I don't really know until the day before when I'm going to cut it. Yeah, no, it's definitely so, logistically challenging. Yes, isn't it? And, yeah. and as you say, you can't take it very far. You've mm. got to you've got to chuck yeah. it around only an hour or two after you've cut it. So, And if you're getting a contractor in to cut your meadow, then precisely. it's difficult yeah. because um, you don't, very, you, very you tricky. don't know when they're coming until the day off, like you say. And it's just a one-off. You, mm. the, you can, as you were pointing out, you can brush harvest the same meadow several times mm. and collect different things each time. Yeah, yeah. So definitely. it's got a lot going for it, hasn't it? Oh, it has, yeah, the seed cuts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess with the green hay, there's no way around the logistics, is it? So, um, unless people can just pick it up um, you know, on the day, then... Um, the, the ton sacks you get, like builder sacks, are great just for putting a load of that's yes. what you, like like you saw in the, in the presentation yes. that we use for the seed. Yeah, that's an easy way you can put them in the back of a car and stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We we did have a, a an arrangement with uh, Bruce a while back that he'd leave a gate open on one of the back fields, <laughs> and we we were all nipping in there with plastic sacks and stuffing it full of wine less hay and chucking it around but the the one thing about that you can be sure of you're not going to do any harm it'll either do nothing or you'll introduce a few new species yeah, exactly. so yeah, it's yeah. not going to harm anything and it's all local and everything exactly yeah. yeah okay well i think we've got no more questions coming up on the chat so i think we can probably wind it up there so yeah, yeah. thank you very much indeed kevin it's a yeah, fascinating very talk. welcome yeah, yeah. excellent um, thank you very much yeah probably see you sometime um probably be another tour at some point yeah um, brilliant yeah. thanks thanks for your, thanks for talk no, okay no yeah. well i think that's it then so good night everybody and thank you for coming okay yeah thanks everyone then okay bye bye, bye.